The stakes were upped considerably for the criminal justice system when, on the 6th of December, 1983, Mervyn Jock Russell, the man at the center of the first rough justice program, walked free. A man who was jailed for life six years ago for murder has been set free by the appeal court. Mervyn Jock Russell was found guilty by an Old Bailey jury of stabbing an art student to death at her flat in South London. But there was concern that the verdict had been based on flimsy evidence. The Jock Russell case was, was the first ever case that was quashed as a result of a single television programme. Prior to that, I think we'd, we'd needed an accumulation of concern, of media concern, about particular cases. It had taken nearly two years, but they had finally done it. Rough Justice marked this historic event with a special programme following Jock Russell's first steps into freedom. Peter and I were obviously absolutely delighted. We had lots of press there, obviously. Uh, and of course, Jock Russell had gate fever, something I'd never heard of before, but you know, it was very evident. Gate fever is the sense of disorientation that can follow release from prison. Six years inside had clearly taken their toll. He was shaking. Um, he was confronted by, you know, this media frenzy, and he was completely out of his depth. So he was in a mess. What has this experience meant for your life? Hell. Pure hell. As with most miscarriages, the real perpetrator of the crime was never prosecuted, denying closure to both the victim's family and Russell himself. It was a very bleak program because conditions for him were still very bad. Compensation was yet to get through. As I understand it, it could take anything up to a year before uh, he gets the money. And that doesn't seem to be right, that the state should make him go cap in hand. I'd have thought a year after his conviction was quashed, he was begging around a debt for trying to find a job and such. He was, he was penniless, I would say. And uh, it's a very sad tale. Jock Russell was the archetypal rough justice case. Low profile, the kind no one else would champion. With rough justice, these were ordinary people who had got themselves in a mess by one way or another and found themselves in jail for years and years and years and years and didn't know what to do about it. In taking the side of the little man, rough justice had picked a fight with the establishment. It was not alone. The early 80s saw tension rise between Margaret Thatcher's conservative government and the media generally. Certainly by the time the Thatcher government came in, I think because of the uh, Thatcher government's natural uh, antipathy uh, and vice versa uh, to journalists, um, it was very tempting for journalists to look for ways of attacking the establishment that they saw being represented and incarnated by that. These were hugely sensitive times, with the Falklands War being the sort of focal point of that. You had a Conservative government with a very uh, powerful uh, Prime Minister, uh, Mrs Thatcher. There was a very feisty and sometimes tricky relationship between the BBC and Number 10 Downing Street. The BBC was accused by the government of revealing British military positions to the enemy during the Falklands War. There's a stage in the coverage of any conflict where you can begin to discern the level of accuracy of the claims and counterclaims of either side. It seems likely that the British have now withdrawn most of their ships to regroup and rethink. And the task force appears to be centred on the carriers, a hundred miles or so east of the Falklands. But if there's been no action today, a little more information... Other BBC programmes were criticised for their coverage of the troubles in Northern Ireland. Such clashes between government and media were becoming frequent. The BBC is in a very uncomfortable place because whenever it does anything that looks uh, political in a way, and Rough Justice very clearly was in some senses a political programme, there was, there was a small p, it looks as if that um, programme is against the government. There was the BBC suddenly questioning the judiciary, suddenly questioning the police, suddenly raising the spectre that there could be miscarriages of justice and arguing on the BBC that they should be investigated. When you add that 
what now seems a toxic mix to the already turbulent relationship that was going on between the government and the BBC, then no wonder that it was a sort of heady, tricky, difficult time. But rough justice paid little heed to the delicate political landscape. The Jock Russell case had vindicated its approach. In 1985, now in its third series and with confidence soaring, rough justice tackled a case of reported burglary committed in Manchester two years earlier. Two men had broken into the flat of Anne Fitzpatrick, a 30-year-old market stall holder. They entered her bedroom, striking her across the face, then smothering her screams with a pillow. They bound her wrists and her ankles, They carried her to the front door before looting the flat and escaping. Fitzpatrick alerted her upstairs neighbour by straining her head to the doorbell. Shortly after, a man named Anthony Mycock was convicted of the crime. Prisoner N17033, Anthony Mycock, is currently serving a five-year sentence for robbery with violence at Franklin Prison in Durham. Rough justice can now show that Anthony Mycock is totally innocent. The proof of that, the absolute proof in this case, is the most remarkable evidence we've ever discovered. The case revolved around the testimony of the only witness, Anne Fitzpatrick, who was also the victim. He had light brown hair which came down onto his forehead and on his hand he had a tattoo at the base of the thumb going to the wrist. It was about an inch big and was shaped like a helmet. Anthony Mycock had a tattoo on his hand. He was the right age, the right build, the right height. He was charged not with assault but with robbery, even though none of the stolen goods were ever found in his possession. Mycock's tattoos were nothing like Fitzpatrick had described, nor was his hair, and his ears had never been pierced yet he was convicted solely on Fitzpatrick's testimony. After close cross-examination by defence counsel, she looked across the courtroom at Anthony Mycock and said, I say that is the man that came into my room that evening. But this was a robbery with a difference. The Mycock case just seemed odd. She claimed to have been attacked during this burglary, and indeed, the sentence was premised on the basis that she had been violently attacked, yet there was no evidence whatever of her having suffered any injury. Further investigation was needed. We went round and we talked to all the flatmates of uh, Anne Fitzpatrick. She said that a lot of jewellery, some of it sounds quite expensive, she said a lot of jewellery had gone. Did you believe that? No. How did you find Anne Fitzpatrick? She was sitting with her back to the door on that step there in this position, crouching position, as if she was tied up. And she was supposed to have jumped up to ring the bell? To ring the bell, yeah. Show me again, could, could you jump up from there to ring a bell? No, I couldn't even leave the ground in this position. A troubling idea took hold in the minds of Hill and Young. Peter and I walked out into the night and on our way back to the hotel, and I said to him, or he said to me, I don't remember, I don't think this actually happened. Could it be possible that this could go all through our courts when a crime didn't occur, and nevertheless this fellow gets sent down for five years when the crime had not happened? Once we discovered that there was a possibility that she'd made it all up, then we thought um, that we really had a story and we called it the case of the perfect proof, which was a little bit of hubris. This overconfidence led Hill and Young down a path that would define their future. They decided they must find and interview Anne Fitzpatrick herself, even though by now she had left Britain. Finding Anne Fitzpatrick goes into investigative technique. Well, first of all, we had to find out where she'd gone. All we'd heard was she'd gone to America. And it took eight different people we had to hire a researcher who had no attachment to the programme at all. She did a survey about the local area in Manchester. She went into the home of the parents of Anne Fitzpatrick and found out that 
and uh, had gone to Los Angeles, she had a job as a nanny there, and indeed um, her parents were going to see her in a few weeks' time. So we set up an operation whereby we had somebody stationed outside the house, got the car number of the taxi that picked them up to go to the airport. We had people stationed along the way to the airport. So we trailed them right to the queue where we already had people in the queue waiting. It was a person in front of them who took the address off the suitcases. We then phoned it through to San Francisco where we had a reporter standing by. He drove down to Los Angeles, uh, but he also took photos of to uh, make sure that he got the right woman and he uh, sent them back to England, and that's how we found him. Hill led the team to Fitzpatrick for the interview that would form the climax of their program. When we first approached her, she pretended to be American, saying she knew nothing of any court case in Manchester. But then, eventually, she told the truth. I was very emotionally upset, and... Um... I, at that time, I thought I'd been burgled. And um, I now want to make that matter clear that I was not burgled. And that um, it was um, a fragment of my imagination. So that Anthony Mycock is innocent? Yes, he is. Do you regret that now? Yes, very much so. Very much so. And what are your feelings about Anthony Mycock, the man in jail? I feel sick. I feel very, very, very sad. What would you now like to see happen for him? To be taken out of prison immediately, to be released, and, um... Well, I'd like to put my arms around and say, tell him I'm sorry. The team were left in no doubt. On Rough Justice, we've been investigating alleged miscarriages of justice for five years. The case of Anthony Mycock is the most outrageous case we've ever come across. A man not only convicted of a crime he did not commit, but a man in prison for two years for a crime that never even happened. In the past, it has taken the Home Office as long as two years to release our previous cases. Surely, with this devastating new evidence, they must release Anthony Mycock now. Surely, they can't leave him in prison for a crime that never happened. The case of the perfect proof was shown on the 3rd of October, 1985. Events unfolded remarkably quickly. The appeal court was convened within weeks, and presiding over it was none other than the Lord Chief Justice himself, Lord Lane. On the back of the rough justice interview, he declared Fitzpatrick's testimony to be unreliable, and Mycock was released. Freed after a television program, the man who shouldn't have been jailed. But Lane also decreed that while Mycock was innocent, the burglary itself had indeed happened, and his judgment carried the hint of trouble ahead. When Lord Justice Lane let Mycock out, he said, reluctantly, we uphold the appeal. Well, how dare he? It's either a just appeal or it's not. You can't be reluctant about it. <laughs> Mycock's release was not to be the main story of this appeal. We'll have a great Christmas. Many were left asking why the head of the judiciary who generally heard the most important cases of the day, had chosen to preside over a case of minor burglary. We soon found out because they were there to put the heaviest of judicial boots in on these journalists who had dared to suggest that they could possibly perform legal business better than lawyers. I thought, and Peter thought, that we were going to the court simply to verify that we had been there in California. Um, and that those were the words that she said. <laughs> How naive of us. Unknown to Hill and Young, Fitzpatrick was now insisting the journalists had intimidated her into giving the interview. Miss Fitzpatrick returned to Britain to be a witness at the appeal court. Under oath, she returned to her original story. There had been a robbery, Tony Mycock was involved, and she changed her mind in the TV interview only because she was under pressure from the rough justice team. Fitzpatrick's revised statement was a serious allegation against the journalists. 